Thank you very much. With this, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Yvonne Perry, who is a professor at now Strathclyde uh, University or the Strathclyde Institute of Pharmacy and Biomedical Sciences. And Yvonne will be talking about lab on bench production of vaccine adjuvants, delivery at the right place and right time. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction and the opportunity to share our work today. So I'm very excited to tell you about the work we've been doing over the last year in trying to translate a vaccine adjuvant system into a more manufacturable product. So I don't need to tell you how important vaccines are from public health. We're all aware of it. But one of the key stumbling blocks we still see is access to effective vaccines. So in terms of cost and globally reaching to patients that need the vaccine. So that's kind of the areas we've been focusing on. So we've been working a long time with the Statin Serum Institute, who originally developed very nice cationic liposome adjuvants. And these are a two lipid system with two components, the cationic lipid dimethyl ammonium bromide, and that gives us a very strong TH2, so it gives us very nice antibody responses. But obviously for quite a lot of vaccines, we also need cell-mediated responses. And to do that, we also incorporate a second lipid within the liposome system, the immunostimulator trehalose dibehenate. Now it's on its own, TDB won't form vesicles, but if you embed it in the liposome, it acts to stabilize the system and as a carrier. And that allows us to generate the Th1 type responses that give us good protection in an adjuvant system. So we've been working with this cationic formulation for a while. You can make it by the standard lipid hydration system. When you make it, you can see it's around about 500 nanometers if we don't process it any further. It's obviously very positive in charge because of the DDA component. We can see the 500, uh, 50 millivolts. And because of that, we work with subunit antigens that are negatively charged. Very easy to stick the antigen onto the surface. So we have electrostatics. Very easy loading system. And we can see that here. So we stained the liposome bilayer in red. And then the antigen is stained with green fluorescent protein we use there, and you can see the dual system. Now in terms of stability, when you have that combination of DDA and TDB, they're very stable in a liquid format for uh, up to 180 days. And actually the TDB element helps stabilize our cationic system because the cationic lipids are straining against each other and actually destabilizes. So the TDB goes in and helps hold the liposome system together. And they have a high transition temperature, so we can see the DSC scan in the bottom there. It's above body temperature, so when it's presented to the antigen presenting cells, it's very rigid in nature, so it comes across as more of a solid particle. So these attributes are all very useful as a vaccine system. So they're able to, the DDA element, cationic lipid, will carry our subunit antigen, and we've been working on models to develop a TB vaccine. So we've been working with antigen 85B ESAT6, so that's a fusion protein, and as I say, it's negatively charged, so it sticks onto the surface. So our cationic liposomes carry our antigen to our antigen presenting cells. The TDB element then stimulates the cells to give us our immune response. So it works with both delivery and adjuvant. And already we've previously been shown through the work at Statin Serum Institute that this combination of the cationic lipid with the ESAT6 was as effective as the BCG Danish, which was a model we were trying to replace. And that's data from a guinea pig trial in protection. So you can see the levels of protection are equivalent. And then we looked into why does it work so well? So we did some biodistribution studies. So if you inject the antigen on its own, IM, it's a subunit protein, the body breaks it down. So if you look at the first graph, you can see it's cleared away from the injection site very quickly, so the red line shows us that. If you look at the second graph, we have DDA, so we have a cationic lipid, with the antigen absorbed on top, and then you can see the red line in the second graph is our antigen staying at the injection site along with the liposome shown in green. And then if you look at a third graph, you can see the exact same profile, so in terms of the ability to hold the antigen at the injection site, the TDB element makes no difference. However, if you look at recruitment for monocytes, and we do that by staining them blue prior to vaccination, you can see when you've got antigen alone at the injection site, we get no infiltration of antigen presenting cells because you see no blue at the injection site. With the second formulation, you can see blue staining, the monocytes are coming into the injection site. 
But if you look at our last formulation, the DDA and TDB together, you see lots of blue staining in the injection site. And that's the liposome sitting there holding the antigen and in come the monocytes to generate that nice strong immune response that we see. And that's shown. So this is our antibodies. We know they're very good. They don't need the TDB element. But we need for uh, the vaccine we were de developing, strong interferon gamma. And you can see the combination of DDA and TDB gives that very high interferon gamma level shown there. So it's not just about delivery. It's about making sure we hold it at the injection site, promote interaction with the invading antigen presenting cells. So as I say, it's basically we inject it in, the cationic liposomes interact with interstitial proteins at the injection site, forms a depot, we get this held at the injection site, in come our monocytes and antigen presenting cells, activated, carry the antigen and delivery system to the lymph nodes, and then we get our strong immune response. So that's how the formulation works. But we were making it by that very basic bang and method lipid hydration. And we all know there's no way that's going to get anywhere near the clinic doing that. So we really need to think about a scale up. And for those that watch Netflix, <laughs> Walter White saying, no way. You cannot use rotary vat. And we all know that. There's no way forward for that. So we had to come up. And that's really how we came across the microfluidic system. We thought, this is great. It's modular. Could give us the exact answer to what we need. So the idea was, we put our solvents in our lipid in one, we just go with aqueous buffer. Now we are not putting the antigen in at this stage because the idea is we want something where modular, we can produce our adjuvant on one site potentially, our antigen at a different site, so basically shorten the production period because you can have them both running simultaneously and then combine them when you're ready to go. So it's all about trying to make it quick, cost effective. We would add the antigen, and that's the formulation. And the idea is you could also have these liposomes sitting ready to go, and then you just add whatever antigen you're looking for at that moment. So the thing was, we had been working with these liposomes, we're at 500 nanometers, and cationic. We didn't really know if those were the key attributes we were looking for. So we took all our old data from in vivo, and we did a post-analysis MVA. So we basically looked at the correlates of protection. We looked at the usual things, the size, the charge of the liposomes, the charge is obviously directly related to the lipid composition, so those two were quite difficult to pull apart. And we looked at a big panel of all our immune responses, as you can see here. And we basically looked for clustering. And we can see on this graph that around DDA, the grey spot, we see the majority of our immune responses are being driven by that cationic element. But if you look down at the bottom, you can see size doesn't cluster with anything. So with our formulation, this particular cationic system, Size is not really relevant to us, which was good because it gave us scope to make a smaller system that's easier to get regulator approval and easier to produce in a more homogeneous way. So we're very happy to see that size could be modified to make it a better product if we so chose. So we set up the standard study design using microfluidics. We looked at flow rate and flow rate ratio. And we figured, check our liposomes for the standard critical attributes, size, charge, lipid recovery and antigen loading. And as I say, it was a post addition of the antigen, so we weren't worried about would the antigen be stable in the process? Do we have to add it prior to it? We wanted to add it at the end. Now the other thing is our lipids, TDB is not the easiest lipid to work with. It doesn't go into many solvents and generally we had to work above 45 degrees which isn't a problem, the microfluidics easily handles it, but if we were going to add the antigen at some stage prior to production, we might not want to increase our temperature. So we looked at ways we could also make these liposomes at a lower temperature. And cholesterol is one of the easy ways to get around transition temperature. So we also made some formulations where we add in cholesterol, reduce our transition, and we can circumvent the problem of temperature if we so choose. So we made four formulations, a standard DDA, TDB, as we call it, CAFO1. We put an increase in cholesterol elements, and we also made a neutral formulation just to check the difference. And we can see we screened the whole panel, and as we can see, as I think most of us are seeing now in microfluidics, the higher the ratio, 5 to 1 aqueous to solvent, gives us much smaller vesicles, but we had the ability to tune the vesicle size to as we chose, depending on that ratio. And the, in terms of adding cholesterol, it made no difference. So we could control our vesicle size. 
and also rate of manufacturing made no difference. So if we wanted to produce vesicles at around 1,000 nanometers, we could do that and we can get down to 500 and less. So rate of manufacture wasn't a problem for us. Now, lipid ratio is one of our key elements. It's very important we keep that DDA to TDB together locked at that ratio. So it was very important for us to check we weren't losing any of the lipid in the process and actually to raise some of the questions that were in the previous talk, were we seeing any clogging or loss in the microfluidic chip? So we set up HPLC with ELSD detection of our lipids because they obviously can't be uh, measured with other techniques. And we're checking out. So we have a graph here that shows lipid hydration the old method, high shear mixing, which is a way to reduce size, and then our microfluidic systems at the three ratios. And what we can see is we get great recovery. Everything we put in with our formulation comes back out. So we're not losing anything, even though the two lipids have quite differing solubilities in the solvent. So that was great, and it was the same when we added cholesterol and even when we used a neutral formulation. So we're very happy to see it kept that important ratio for us in terms of adjuvant activity. In terms of ability to put antigen on the surface, this was our standard formulation before we went into microfluidics, very high loading, as you would expect from electrostatics. We were able to replicate it and actually reduce the variation by using microfluidics because we get more controlled size. So we get very high loading and good antigen recovery with the system. And in terms of adding cholesterol, what we found was actually Whilst it was good for manufacture, in terms of immune response, it's not so good. When we start to put in the cholesterol, we start to see our immune responses shown here with interferon gamma and IL-2 starting to dip down. And when we investigated that more, we found it was the macrophages aren't so happy with more cholesterol in the system. We're looking at that in more detail why, but at the moment, we're going to just stick with DDA, TDB, no extra uh, ingredients, and it works very well both in production and immune responses. So as I say, we're adding the antigen at the end, but there is a solvent that we all know we have to get rid of. And we were really trying to figure out we need a method one step. So to remove the solvent, we were investigating using TFF. So we wanted to use tangential flow where we could get our liposomes and remove any permeate, including free drug or antigen in this case. So we set that up with a small on the bench system. So we have our microfluidics, a collection vial, and then we go through a TFF system. And in terms of size, it was a very small system and it was developed by Nicholas at UCL. So you can see we had basically a small system where we have our membrane and our gasket, we put our liposomes through, we can recycle any non-entrapped antigen, and we get our liposomes out. The name was to be below the levels for ethanol content. And that's actually what it looks like, it's a very small system that was designed and it just tees into the end of the microfluidics as a product comes out and then you just send it through here. So that's what it basically looks like in real life. And then what the idea is, collect a free antigen. So. so this is our data. So we had to check that the back pressure, as we pushed it through, we weren't actually going to force the liposomes through the membrane because you can't extrude liposomes from being there. So we increased the back pressure Going along, you can see what we have is the particle size in the black and the PDI in the grey. So the liposomes are quite happy staying there and we retain our liposome system. But if we did go too high a pressure, we actually do start to extrude liposomes through. So we need to stay below 75 PSI as a back pressure. So that was easy to do, straightforward. And in terms of what we did, so we did three cycles through the TFF system, and we've normalized up to 100% in terms of what was left in. So we didn't have 100% to begin with of ethanol and OVA we were using. But you can see we get it down to 95% of the solvent that was in there is removed, and 75% of free protein that was in there is also removed. So we're well below any requirements to get this uh, through regulatory products. So that was very exciting. So we basically have a one-step manufacture through TFF, and we have a liposome vaccine product available to go. And we checked again, what we put in, do we get it back out? In terms of lipid recovery, yes, that was great. And also in terms of if we need to concentrate up, because sometimes we might want to concentrate up our vaccines. So we were able to also do this with our TFF system. So we were able to manufacture, concentrate, and produce a product in a very compact system by connecting the 
microfluidics to a TFF system. And so in summary, we were able to do, produce these vaccines to give us right place production of the immune response in terms of giving the depot and antigen presenting cells. And geographically, we would be able to deploy this as a modular system for modular continuous manufacturing. In terms of right time, it's scalable, it's fast, and you would be able to rapidly respond to the need for new vaccine adjuvants given that. And just to acknowledge this is a long-term collaboration between ourselves and the Staten Serum Institute, and thank you for your attention, it's appreciated. Yeah, thanks, Yvonne, for this nice talk. Um, you talked about DDA and the depot effect. Yes. Did you also test anionic lipids? Yes, actually, I had a slide, but I took it out. So if you have a cationic system, it will stay there. If you have a neutral system, they both flow away, and the negative flow away as well. You can, if you po put a positive antigen onto a negative liposome, they flow together, but uh, away from the depot site. If you have a cationic liposome with a cationic antigen, the liposome stays there, but the antigen flows away. So really the only combination that we get the depot is a positive liposome or negative antigen. But it may be that routing it to the lymph node in another environment may be better. So. Okay, thanks. I have a question for you. Not if it's as mean as the last one. <laughs> <laughs> if nobody else is right now. You mentioned that um, the, um, the immune stimulatory effect went down when adding cholesterol. Mm -hmm. You'll have to excuse my ignorance in the, uh, well, my, my ignorance in the, in the vaccine field, but uh, what is your explanation for that? Yeah, so we don't 100% know, but it was definitely the depot the same, the biodistribution was the same, so we thought it should work the exact same because we did track how, how it left the site, but when we exposed macrophages to them, they just didn't seem to like the cholesterol content as much, which is unusual because normally cholesterol rafts and things like that are associated with some of the cell damage, and, but certainly they weren't able to take up the liposomes the same, so whether they were just too compact with the cholesterol in the bilayer, we're not quite sure, but definitely it was to do with the macrophages being able to take them up and not how they root in the body. So there's definitely two elements, pharmacokinetics and cellular mechanisms. Interesting. Uh, what, what's the uh, minimum volume you need for this TFF module, this very tiny one? Uh, that was running, what were we running? The, the intermediate vial was one ml. So that's all we were, so it was an Eppendorf, so it was very small volumes, because yeah. our lipids are so expensive, so it's painful to do that. So yeah, we had set it up for a tiny, tiny amount. Yeah, so pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. I have a question regarding stability of uh, trehalose mm -hmm. because there's some effect we are calling uh, acyl dancing on the ring. So acyl can move from one mm -hmm. hydroxyl to another, and you can lose the activity. So did you study the, the, this effect? Yeah, no, we haven't done that actually. We haven't looked at that. We, the stability we've ran is up to 180 days in a liquid form and two years as a freeze dried product that had been gamma irradiated. And everything looked fine, but I, I don't think we've looked at it in the detail that might pick up that. So it, it's a very nice point. Yeah, we maybe need to look at it in more detail. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.